Joseph, welcome into the game here in Tuscaloosa for our very first conversation. I'm looking forward to having a talk with you, and thank you again for joining us here in Tuscaloosa. Uh, my pleasure, Ryan. Love the show. Love, uh, love SEC football and uh, chomping at the bit here for week number one of the college season. Well, we're counting it down to Alabama football. I know that we're a little less for uh, everybody else, but today we are one zero zero, one hundred days away from Alabama and Florida State. Let me start there. Let me get your thoughts on what you look and try to project because you've got. Forget about calling this a book. It's like an encyclopedia. Uh, it's not your typical, you know, inch, no, half inch uh, thick magazine. This thing is quite thick. It's a college football preview. Let me get your thoughts on the Crimson Tide. Yeah, I mean, what can you say about Nick Saban and what he's able to do in, in Tuscaloosa? I mean, dynamic job for uh, Alabama last year getting back to the national championship game. I mean, has a dynamic quarterback in Jalen Hurts. You're talking about an Alabama team, Ryan, as you know, that has won 15 straight week number one games by an average margin of victory of 25.4 points per game. The last Alabama loss on week number one of the season came at home in Tuscaloosa to UCLA uh, with Skip Hicks and uh, Corey Powell uh, at quarterback. So it's been a long time since Alabama's lost a week one game But by and far, this is their hardest and most difficult opponent in the Florida State Seminoles and DeAndre Francois. Joseph, when I I get into the conversation, this is the part, and Drew DeArmond's here with me as well, and I I generally, I'm by myself, but uh, Drew does a radio show, and you guys need to somehow connect. We'll, We'll share some numbers. Drew does a big radio program here each and every morning from 9 until noon. Uh, in Huntsville and throughout the North Alabama. So uh, him and I are radio buddies, and we're looking forward to hanging out with you here for a couple of minutes. So uh, Drew may pop in here and ask some questions as well. But when I look at Alabama, this is what's crazy to me. Everybody, and I, I don't know if you have it. Do you have them in that number one spot, Joseph? No, actually, I don't. I think I, I picked them 9-3 and three this year, but having win, winning the SEC West, people could think I'm crazy. I mean, I base that off the fact that they lose 36 and a half of the team's leading 54 sacks with the Reuben Foster, Tomlinson, Allen, uh, you know, Brian Anderson, Tim Williams, because of that loss on the defensive side of the ball, I think it's going to be very difficult to just plug in players and make up for that production week number one of the season. And I think they can lose three games in, in 2017. All right, so now now you got my attention, okay? Because this is where I'd love to be able to walk down. Nine and three. So you've got Alabama at nine and three. Joseph, let me ask you this, okay? Do you realize that you will you will have – the people in Tuscaloosa jumping off the bridge. If this if this team is nine and three, uh, unfortunately, there's going to be people that are going head first uh, off the bridge here in Tuscaloosa. So well, I, I, I got to t- know. Go ahead. No, I totally understand. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Sorry for interjecting. No problem. No, 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 no. I'm I'm just getting nervous here. Nine and three. I'm I'm Tuscaloosa. Please, please settle down. Settle down. Joseph <laughs> just giving us his his projections. Okay. Uh, all right. So so here's my thing. Nine and three. Give me the teams that. First off, let's start with number one. Who is the biggest challenge for Alabama? Well, I think it comes week number one with Florida State. I mean, even though Alabama's won 15 straight games, this by by far is the most talented team that they played week number one of the season. I, even last year when they faced USC, they've beaten up on teams like Clemson, like Virginia Tech, West Virginia uh, over the years. But I think the speed of Florida State will really challenge out Alabama secondary much the way Clemson did in the national championship game. I think the one concern I have for Alabama outside the defense, Ryan, is the fact that Brian Dable is new offensive coordinator. I've always said this. Even though you still have the same offensive talent, when you have a new offensive coordinator or a defensive coordinator, you're seeing the game through a different set of eyes. That coordinator's got to understand how the, uh, that talent responds in game situations, and then he has to call a game plan around that. It doesn't come as quickly as a lot of people think, even though Lane Kiffin had great success with Jalen Hurts and with the offensive system 
under uh, Nick Saban. I don't think it's as smooth as, uh, of a transition as many people think. And not only that, but an offensive coordinator has to get into a rhythm to understand how that talent responds in game situations. And he might be less aggressive than Lane Kiffin was on certain downs. And I think that's where I have concerns week number one against a, a solid Florida State team. Okay, so going past Florida State, help me with the other two teams that will be a challenge because uh, if, the, if it's true with your projections of 9-3, and three, give me the two other teams that may possibly beat Alabama. Well, I mean, I think you look with LSU, even though LSU does come to Tuscaloosa, I mean, the one team that will not fear Alabama, especially at home, will be the LSU Tigers. Where will they be from a quarterback perspective with Danny Edling remains to be seen, but I think you can't just discount that game because it's in Tuscaloosa. I mean, I I think when you look at Alabama overall, on top of the great uh, physical and athletic talent they possess – there's a fear factor in terms of dominating teams in the SEC. I think some teams are afraid of Alabama, they, and they're defeated before they even step on the field. Well, one team that isn't afraid of Alabama, in my opinion, is the LSU Tigers. It's a rivalry game, and you can't discount it, you know, even though it's at home. The other game is obviously Auburn as well. It's a rivalry game, even though they've won the last three over the Auburn Tigers by 15 points per game. Anything can happen, and I think you have, to, you have to mark that game, last game of the year in the Iron Bowl. They play at Texas A&M, even though they dominated last year at home. It's a tough road game. And then Arkansas with Austin Allen at quarterback would be a concern of mine, even though that, in, that game is at home as well. All right, Joseph, when you look at Alabama, let me, let me get your thoughts on Jalen Hurts. I'm, I'm really curious to hear your opinion of maybe where he goes in year number two as the starting quarterback here in Tuscaloosa? Well, I mean, I, again, Calvin Ridley had a, a, an off year after his freshman season. He'll be the go-to guy. Josie Jewell looked great in spring spring ball. But the loss of O.J. Howard's going to hurt that offense, I feel like. And, I, and that's going to be the progression of Jalen Hurts. Coupled with the fact of how do they utilize him in terms of his running ability. I mean, I, I think Lane Kiffin really got the most out of Jalen Hurts, but when he was forced to play in the pocket and make his reads and progressions, that's where he struggled as a quarterback. So how will Brian Dable utilize that? in the 2017 season remains to be seen. And I think that he needs to improvise in order to get the most out of his talents. But we'll see if he can do it uh, week number one against Florida State's defense. You know, a lot of the questions that I have around Alabama is, you know, when you look at Jalen Hurts, do they keep him in that comfort zone, as you said, mobile quarterback, running quarterback, or – do they try to make him more of a pocket passer? Do they keep him? He needs to improve in that area. He, he wasn't very good when we talk about beyond 20 yards. I know he was a freshman. 19 of 58, when you talk about it, that's, what, 32 33%. Uh, when you look at beyond 20 yards, definitely he needs to improve. Uh, but if they really do come back to a pro st- system, then, then Jalen Hurts may struggle when you ask him to stay in the pocket. Uh, and that's the thing. I think how will Brian Dable utilize him? I, I'm a big believer in that you go with the uh, the player's strengths. I don't think you try and make him something that he's not. He showed great ability outside the pocket in terms of once he broke contain to, to improvise and, and make plays with his legs. You could look at that game in Death Valley. I mean, his touchdown run solidified that victory over the LSU Tigers. So when he breaks contain, he's a lethal quarterback. Why you would want to change that? Just because you want him to be a pocket passer, I think that's where the concern lies because I don't think he's as strong as some of the other quarterbacks within the SEC in the pocket, and that's going to be the make-it-or-break-it decision whether Nick Saban and Brian Dable want to do that uh, for him in, in the upcoming season. And, and Joseph, this is Drew Armin. I wanted to ask you a little bit about FSU and about that opener because uh, the questions I have about FSU, I think they're very talented. I think it's the most talented team that Nick Saban's going to face uh, in his tenure. Probably second would be Clemson in the 2008 uh, year when uh, they were able to really get their program rolling. But I have questions about the, uh, the Florida State offensive line. They had trouble protecting Francois. And Charles Kelly, his defense really struggled in a lot of their big games last year, especially when you remember how they got shredded by uh, Louisville. How do, you, how do you see them matching up against Alabama? 
Well, I think they have to be aggressive, and you bring up great points in terms of Florida State's defense. By no way, shape, or form were they a dominant defense, especially in the early part of the season, and much of that was due to Derwin James's injury. But they got better as right. the season progressed, and they got better against the run. I mean, a big loss for the Florida State's defense is going to be Demarcus Walker that led that team with 16 and a half sacks. But from an athletic perspective, in terms of being able to run Sideline to sideline with Alabama, Florida State has talent. Now, Dalvin Cook is gone. They have Jacques Patrick, and that's going to be the difference as well. They lose Travis Rudolph and Bobo Wilson, their big play wide receivers. But from a quarterback perspective, DeAndre Francois is a seasoned guy that got better. He's going to be a confident quarterback, and it's the the, the – uh, game plan perspective week number one that I have the concern about. I mean, it's it's six months to prepare for an Alabama defense that loses those starters that I mentioned. You mentioned the offensive line, but the defensive starters that are going to be going up against that offensive line, even though they have some game experience, it's not like the group in 2016 that, that held uh, opposing the offenses to 63 yards per game rushing on the ground and dominated from a defensive perspective. So that's the concern I have for Alabama going up against Florida State's team in that week one matchup. All right, so, so your projection right now, let me, let me invite you real quick before – because I know we've got a few minutes left that I'd love to be able to, to have it continue uh, this talk for a couple of minutes. Let me invite, how, how can people connect with you? Because you've got a really outstanding preview. I love all the nuggets inside. I mean, it's a great-looking college football preview. And as we travel into this big holiday weekend, uh, it's a great way to access this if people are hungry for more college football. Invite people how they can connect with you and, and be able to purchase your publication. Yeah, they can go on Amazon and search for Go For The Two. It's a Power 5 preview, college football preview. They can go to my website, go for the two, the number 2com All the information's there. If they want to hit me up on Twitter, I'll, I'll answer any question I have. It's Go For The Two. It's the number 2. And I could just say this about Alabama. I've been an Alabama fan. I grew up in New Jersey. But guys like Chris Anderson, Lemansky Hall, Dennis Riddle, Freddie Kitchens, I'm not an Alabama hater. I just look at these games objectively and see where teams can lose and, and really judge teams based off the strengths and weaknesses of the previous year. So that's, that's when I look at Alabama in 2017. That's where I see concerns. But if, if Nick Saban and the crew prove me wrong, I'll be the first one to admit it. Joseph, uh, you have a couple of minutes here. I'd like to be able to extend you here for just a couple of minutes sure. to be able to talk some sure. more college football. Um, Without a doubt. Let me, let me, let me continue here. I, I want to go back here because I'm. You, you got to understand, okay? Alabama coming off of that national title loss, this fan base is, you know, they're. I don't know if you want to call it anxiety, nervous. Uh, this is very few programs in the country. They expect to win a national title every year. When they don't succeed, it becomes a failure. Well, what you're talking about with 9-3, and three, as I said, I mean, you would put these guys completely off the cliff. I don't know if they'd be able to take it. I don't even know if I'd want to stay in radio if Alabama went 9-3. and three. So when let's think positive here just a minute, okay? Because I don't want to be picking up, uh, you know, aluminum cans. I want to be able to do my job as far as radio. All right, help me with, with when you look at the SEC and the SEC West. I know we've already talked about Auburn. We've already talked about LSU. But do you realistically believe in the coaches in the SEC West? I mean, do you believe that these coaches can be championship-caliber coaches when you look at the SEC West? Well, no, you bring up great points. I mean, Brett Bielma, in my opinion, is on the hot seat, especially after they're blowing double-digit leads to Virginia Tech and Missouri at the end of the year. Uh, you're absolutely right about Kevin Sumlin, a coach that starts fast and, and can't get it through from the start of the season to the end of the year. And Gus Miles on another coach that's on the hot seat. But here's the thing I look at. I just look at if, uh, when you look at Alabama, it's not so much the other teams. When I look at Alabama, it's more than just one moving part that they've had in recent years. They've started with uh, three straight starting quarterbacks, but all the other pieces seem to be in place. Now you're losing six starters on that defense. And two big play losses with Eddie Jackson and Marlon Humphrey in the secondary, two veterans that really solidified that group. Even though Minka Fitzpatrick is coming back, you have those losses on the defensive side of the ball. You lose Cam Robinson, you lose O.J. Howard, you lose Ardarius Stewart, and now you have a new offensive coordinator 
that's where I see the moving parts and the concerns if you're an Alabama fan. Even though Nick Saban has done it year in and year out, it's a lot of moving parts, especially week number one against Florida State. Let me ask you, do you see this as the dynasty telling off? I mean, all dynasties have to come to an end. This thing's not going to run forever. Do you see this as the, the beginning of the end? I think it could be a slow decline. Again, I still picked Alabama to win the SEC West with a 9-3 and overall record, but I didn't have them being in the playoff this year. So, again, I think uh, when you look at it, I think they could possibly be there next year, but I think this year is going to be a difficult transition, and it's my projection. It's, it's a beginning-of-the-year projection. Obviously, when the season takes form after week number one and two, I make another gauge as to where the teams are from strengths and weaknesses, but it possibly can be a, a chink in the armor if you're an Alabama Crimson Tide fan. And, uh, Joseph, I wanted to ask you about LSU because you bring up a good point, and uh, the, the, the quarterback development is going to be crucial at Alabama, but it's also going to be crucial at LSU. And we saw Matt Canada do a lot of great work at Pitt. He turned a guy like uh, Nathan Peterson uh, uh, into an NFL-caliber QB, a guy that was drafted. Uh, and I saw him start a game against Alabama at, at uh, Tennessee, and quite frankly, I never would have thought that. But Nathan Peterman had a great year last year for Pitt. Do you think he can have the same effect on Danny Etling, who uh, provided some stability for LSU last year, but in certain situations, especially against Alabama, had trouble moving that offense? Yeah, he can. I mean, again, you bring up a great point. Uh, what's the health of uh, Danny Etling? He did have uh, off-season shoulder surgery. We have to see how that plays out as fall camp opens up. I've said this. I mean, they lose Malachi Dupree. They lose Traven Doral on the outside. Those are two big losses for LSU's offense. But it's not so much how much he opens up that offense. It's when he calls the plays in terms of uh, aggression. Does he call play action passes on first and second down to loosen up opposing defenses from stacking the box, which will open up running lanes later in games? I think that's the key point, whether Matt Canada does that. He did that with Pittsburgh. Nate Peterman had a fantastic year last year and actually got him drafted in the NFL draft. So it's when he calls pass plays that I think is more important than how many times they pass in a particular game, whether he can be aggressive on first First or second down will be whether LSU uh, can defend, can challenge Alabama in the SEC West. Joseph, let me ask you. I know we've already talked about Florida State, but give me a couple of other teams. So basically, if Alabama's nine and three, they're out of this college football playoffs, right? I mean, you, you, if nine and three, they're, they're not making the college football playoffs, correct? Yep, correct. I have Clemson coming back there. I think when you look at the Clemson Tigers, even though they lose uh, Deshaun Watson, they lose uh, Wayne Gallman, they lose Mike Williams, they still have a great group of core wide receivers that are coming back. Deion Kane, Hunter Renfro, Ray Ray McLeod, and that defensive front seven led by Dexter Lawrence to me is really going to be where Clemson will be a lot stronger than they were last year. Even at the end of the year, I expect them to step up. Uh, the one thing I think when you look at uh, Dabo Sweeney as a head coach, I mean, Nick Saban reloads year in and year out, and the one team that seems to be doing the same thing is in Clemson with Dabo Sweeney. Three years ago, they were the number one statistical defense under Brett Venables. They held teams to 261 total yards per game. They lost eight starters from that defense and made it to the national championship game against Alabama. They lost. They lost another six starters and then reloaded to get back to the national champion, championship game and win it. I, I think it's eerily similar to what Nick Saban has built in Tuscaloosa, and that's why I like Clemson to get back to the college football playoff in 2017. All right, so you have Clemson. Who, who else is the other three teams? And I, I know we don't have too much time here, but g give me the other teams that you have. I have Penn State. I think Penn State is the best team in the Big Ten this year. Oklahoma State is the big, t big uh, team in the Big 12. And I have an upset special in the SEC. I have Georgia knocking off Alabama in the SEC championship game. That's why the Crimson Tide don't make it to the 2017 playoff. <laughs> 